soft, most wonderful plans for the 2021 Ojai Festival is a project called I Still Play, a project which was a commission from 11 composers to honor the retiring president of Nonsuch Records, Robert Hurwitz. Bob, over his extraordinary career, which continues, has brought together some of the most imaginative musicians in the world to create some of the greatest records made in the last 30 years. I always like to say about Bob, he knows what we're going to love next. And to honor Bob, Nonsuch asked these composers who are all so close to him and who are so generously represented by Nonsuch each to write a very personal private piece for Bob, who is a serious, serious devoted pianist in his private life, who begins each day by playing the piano. So to honor this project and our plans at Ojai, we asked three of the central people in the project just to gather and have a conversation among friends. First, of course, Bob Hurwitz himself, but also composer and pianist Tim O'Andrus will be playing it at Ojai and the wondrous and just heavenly composer performer Laurie Anderson. Um, and so we, uh, we invite you to join us now for a part of this conversation among friends. Hi, Bob. Hi, Laurie. Hi, Timo. Hi, Bob. <laughs> it's good to see you both. Hey, we're talking about um, I Still Play. That's a nice thing to talk about for me. I, think I Still Play is something that you say. I think that's a, that's a Bob quote. That I think, I think it is, although as I'm sure all of us know, we say many things that we never think we're gonna hear again once we say. <laughs> much, much less as the title of a record. Much, much less. But, you know, John is very clever with his titles. Um, he's always been. And so, um, and, and I'm sure at some point I must have said something like that. And um, when I decided that I was going to quit my day job of going into the office every day at Nonsuch, um, David Bither, uh, who is a long time colleague and close friend, decided um, against my, my wishes that he wanted to create some kind of event um, that would, would mark the occasion. And so he did a very um, uh, wise thing and he gave John Adams a call uh, and a few other people. But his first call, was, I think one of his first calls was to John and John made the suggestion that um, Bob's always looking for new things to play on the piano. And um, why don't all of his none such friends write piano pieces for him that he could actually play? And so I guess, I don't know if David reached out to you, Lori, or David reached out to you, Timo, but um, 11 people, uh, there were actually 13 people who were asked um, and uh, two people had to withdraw, but somehow miraculously these 11 beautiful piano pieces were written this is the greatest gift i've ever received in my life this is really something that i i it's even as i'm talking about it now four years after the fact it's kind of hard that tim andrus and Lori anderson and john adams and philip glass and steve reich and donica dennehy and randy newman and nico muley and all these great great musicians wrote a piece that I can play because I still play. <laughs> <laughs> I will say one other thing. And that is as someone who's played the piano since I was seven or eight years old and never to a degree where I ever thought it would be a career but something that has always given me immense pleasure. One of the things I missed, one of the things first of all I'm grateful for is that um, many of the great composers of the last centuries, you know, starting with certainly Bach um, above all, 
wrote pieces, and, and you could say that about Mozart and Beethoven and Schubert and all the way up through Ravel and Debussy, all wrote pieces that some of them were concert pieces meant for highly skilled virtuosos and other pieces that someone who took a little time and effort and initiative could actually play on the piano. Mm -hmm. And and I, and I and certainly there are some very good pieces written in the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, but there it's, it, there's a paucity of that by comparison. And I think that one of the great things about having, for example, pieces by the two of you or these other composers that, um, that do not ask for someone um, who has a very high level technique to play is, a, is an incredible gift for all pianists. Um, because, and, and, and as I know, just having heard your performances, there are also pieces with real challenges that, that actually can be played in public. They're not, you, you wrote a beautiful note about, I still play about the private quality of it, but it's also, there are pieces, and, and for me, one of the great um, parts of that gift is that each of these pieces were a kind of direct lesson from the person who wrote it. I think after I learned how to play each of these pieces, I understood them as people a little bit more and I understood them as composers and how it fit into all the other things that they did, that it was not just um, something to play, but it's something to learn from. And that's also part of this, the wondrous nature of this gift. Laurie, I'm curious, you, I know you've written pieces for Kronos Quartet and uh, some other close collaborators, but I'm not aware of any other solo piano music in your <laughs> this catalog, is it. catalog, so to speak. This, this is the catalog of solo piano works what, by how me. Did, how did you, uh, how <laughs> it's did you, one. Approach, how did you <laughs> approach that? Because I have my theories. It's a very gnomic little piece. I have my theories uh -huh. about it, but I, I want to hear um, how you approached it. Gnomic, what a nice word, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I always thought it would be great to write something specifically for someone. And I, I've i only done that once, which was um, uh, my sculpture teacher was Saul LeWitt and he was doing a lot of uh, number drawings. And I said, Saul, those really look like, um, scores and he said well uh do it so I, I wrote something called a quartet for Saul and um and then just recently revived that and it was really it came from that number series and I um got to play this with a with a quartet in uh Mass Mocha where uh Saul LeWitt has a lot of his work installed mm -hmm. and um I don't believe in ghosts, but I have seen three ghosts, although I don't believe in them. <laughs> so uh, we, they were playing this music and Saul arrived. I don't know how that happened. I think numbers and music maybe do that to some <laughs> people, but it, he, it was so clear, so eerie that there he was. So anyway, uh, when I got this opportunity to um, write something specifically for my friend Bob, I thought this is really uh, challenging because I that's the only the second time, and uh, uh, so I I thought I guess mostly of our lunches, our conversations at lunch, and they would just kind of go here and then they would stop for a moment and then they'd go back that way and then they'd stop and they'd circle around and I love this feeling of pause of slight hesitation and I tried to build that tentativeness in it that gnomic tentativeness and uh, <laughs> I, I really appreciate uh, uh, the way you approach that piece and and you keep that in there I have no idea what, what note's going to come next and it feels like you don't either well it it does I was going to say it does have uh 
very conversational, almost sort of antiphonal quality to it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, as well as a very rhetorical quality that the, each gesture is very contained, sort yeah. of a, a little self-contained thought, mm -hmm. and that, but that they sort of set each other off mm -hmm. sort of antiphonally, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I really love the way you played that. I played it for Lori, um, yeah. and she came over to the house. And I think you said at that point it was the first time you heard the piano version. It was, yeah. Before Timo did it, and I, and I think I played it for you twice, and each time was a little bit different. <laughs> yeah. If I yeah. Put that down today and played it, it would still be a little bit different. That's good. It's a piece that allows you each time you look at it, there's there's a space to yeah. kind of determine the length of the notes and the chords in that piece. And, and, and so um, there was a certain delight that I felt just learning it. Um, and I was so moved to be able to play it for you. I would say even in Timo's piece, um, which there, there's a few places where Timo plays it in, I mean, he wrote the piece for God's sake. But there's a few places where he plays it in a way that I thought, oh, really? Um, I, <laughs> I would call it the wound dresser section, which is Ooh. sort of the end of the third page. Um, and um, and I, I just thought that he had written this, these incredible chords that were moving, especially in the left hand. And, as I, just, and I just thought, this shouldn't be played too fast. And you should be able to sit on these chords a little bit because 
They're so deeply emotional at that point. I will say that I've never told you this, Timo, that um, I was at John's house and I was very nervous because I played him a few things. And I played him that. And at that section, I said, you know, John, this does remind me a little bit of the wound dresser. And John, when I played it, started reciting the words. <laughs> In the part that it was like that, which was incredibly moving. So but, but the piece is also just such a joy. It was a joy to learn and a joy to play. 